Hello, I'm John Johnson with the Spine and Neuro Center. Today we'll be talking about lumbar disc herniations as well as a new technology for annular repair. This is a joint course with Huntsville Hospital and the Spine and Neuro Center. You can obtain one hour of CME credit at the conclusion of this DVD by following the instructions at the end. In the order of disclosure, I have nothing to disclose. Huntsville Hospital is very appreciative of an unrestricted educational grant from Annulex. And Huntsville Hospital is an accredited provider of CME. Welcome. Again, I'm John Johnson with the Spine and Neuro Center in Huntsville, Alabama. We have five neurosurgeons, myself, Dr. Rhett Murray, Dr. Joel Pickett, Dr. Chang Tao, and Dr. Jason Banks. Our objectives today will be to discuss lumbar disc herniations and the symptoms. We'll examine some of the minimally invasive treatment options, including using the Metrix tubular retractor, and we'll explore new innovative repair technology called X-Close to reduce the risk of recurrent disc herniations. Back pain is one of the most common reasons for going to the doctor. In fact, in most family practice clinics, it's the second most common reason to see the doctor next to the common cold. There are over 11 million doctor visits each for back pain on an annual basis, and there are 19 million people in the United States who suffer some form of back pain on a regular basis. Over $80 billion is spent each year due to back pain, and it's the second most common cause of missed work days. Back pain is the leading cause for disability between the ages of 19 to 45, and it represents 16% of all workers' compensation claims. Chronic back pain in the lumbar region can be caused by many etiologies, including degeneration of intervertebral disc, and we typically will favor a non-invasive treatment initially. When such treatment no longer provides relief, solutions from a surgical standpoint include discectomy, decompression, fusion, and non-fusion or motion sparing technologies such as disc replacement. It's estimated that over 250,000 lumbar discectomies are done each year in the United States. When you look at the breakdown of back pain, there's approximately 19 million individuals who will suffer from back pain on an annual basis. 11 million people will have their quality of life significantly reduced. And 2.5 million people will be enrolled in some type of conservative treatment such as either physical therapy, a soft collar, pain management, of that two and a half million, approximately a little less than a half a million will progress to surgical intervention. And of those, 300,000 or more will have chronic back pain and potentially receive fusion operations in the future. So what is a disc herniation? Well, a disc is basically the shock absorber in between the two bones. It's composed of a tout, a tough outer core, and then a soft inner jelly called the nucleus propulsus. Thus, when we hear the term HNP, that stands for herniated nucleus propulsus. Oftentimes, when this disc can herniate, it can compress on either the spinal cord or the nerve root. When it presses on the nerve root, it causes a radiculopathy, and a radiculopathy that runs down the leg is often called sciatica. And looking at the lumbar disc anatomy, the lumbar disc are basically the shock absorbers or the cushions between each of the vertebral bodies. The discs are composed of two elements, the nucleus propulsus, which is the soft, gel-like inner substance, and then the annulus, which is the tough outer ring, much like the outer ring on a, on a tire with the radial fibers. A herniated disc is when there is a rupture in the annulus and the nucleus is able to push out and compress a spinal cord or a nerve root. The symptoms for this will include dull or sharp back pain, muscle spasms, weakness in the legs or numbness, and radiating pain extending from the buttocks into the legs consistent with sciatica. If you look on this slide, you can see the small little piece of red disc that's pushed out, compressing one of the lumbar nerve roots. So the traditional option from a surgical standpoint is to go in and shave this off after the patient has failed to respond to conservative treatment. Most patients are going to improve with conservative treatment, but once they don't, we look at surgical intervention where we'll go in and shave that disc off. This is the most commonly performed spine surgery in the United States, and it's done both in inpatient and in the outpatient hospital setting. So what happens during a discectomy? Well, basically we'll go in and shave off that disc, but when we do this, we'll actually make a small little hole or a pathway in the annulus to re retrieve or resect that small jelly or nucleus propulsus. We've really not had an effective way of repairing that defect following lumbar surgery until just recently. And when you look at the small little defect in the annulus, one of our concerns is that can potentially lead to reherniation or for some of the other loose nucleus propulsus to herniate out 
compressing the nerve root and basically putting us back in the same situation we're in at the beginning. When you look at lumbar discectomies, there's a whole variety of approach, aggressive versus less aggressive, open, closed, uh, minimally invasive. But overall, the success rates in today's minimally invasive microdiscectomies are about 85 to 95 percent. But that's really not good enough. That means that 5 to 15 percent are having a less than ideal outcome and there's significant room for improvement. So what are the types of discectomy surgery? Well, we alluded to this a little bit earlier. An open discectomy is where we go in and remove a portion of the disc. Often this is an open operation where we don't use a microscope or just magnification at most, such as the loops in our glasses as demonstrated in this picture. A microdiscectomy is when we make this through a very small incision and we'll actually use an operating microscope to magnify our anatomy so it can make a very minimally invasive approach. And then a percutaneous discectomy is where we'll use a small cannula and usually using C-arm guidance just basically remove the disc uh, actually not having visualization at the time of that intervention. A traditional discectomy, which is rarely performed anymore, is, would require up to a four inch incision in the middle of the back. And this was associated with the extensive stripping of the muscle from the spine so that we could get to the affected disc. Fairly large invasive operation and over the years this has improved now to the minimally invasive approach that we'll discuss. This is where we actually make a small incision and basically through a series of dilating channels split the muscle without actually cutting it. We're able to actually go down, identify the disc, and resect the portion of the loose disc that's compressing the nerve with minimal damage or trauma to the adjacent tissues. Who can benefit from the new minimally invasive operation? Well, approximately 70 to 90 percent of people that require a herniated disc surgery are candidates for the minimally invasive approach. This is the most common operation performed in the United States and it will be done approximately 250,000 times this year. How do we do it? Well, basically, as you see, we have a series of dilating cannulas here. We're using a fluoroscope or a C-arm in the operating room. We'll precisely locate the level that we're interested in, make a small stab incision, and then generally and gradually open the muscle up to about a three-quarter inch incision is created. Then working through this small channel of a tube, which can be 16 to 18 millimeters in diameter, we'll go in and resect the disc that's pinching the nerve and really have an excellent outcome where we decrease the pressure on the nerve, relieving the back and the sciatica or the leg pain. This is an example of what a herniated disc looks like and basically by removing that small little piece of disc herniation that's pinching the nerve, the nerve then will quit causing the inflammation, irritation and pain that we associate with the sciatica. Our goal, however, is now to improve our outcome by preserving the disc material, both the annulus or the outer covering and the nucleus, while ultimately repairing the annulus and preserving disc structure which can improve our post-operative outcome. When you look at patients after discectomy, up to 15% of people will really have ongoing issues. Of these, about 50% will lead to reoperation. This can involve a reentry discectomy, a lumbar fusion, or a lumbar disc replacement. And the other half will be treated with ongoing conservative treatment, typically with options such as uh, pain management, epidurals, anti-inflammatories, ongoing physical therapy, or chiropractic manipulation. When you look at some of the discectomy reoperation rates, they really vary anywhere from 9.4% to as high as 25%. So the real question is how much disc do you remove? It's intuitive that if you go in and remove almost all the disc, your reherniation rate is going to be a little bit lower. But is that really necessary and what are the implications of doing that? Well, what are the trade-offs? Doing a minimal discectomy, you're going to maintain more disc height, but you'll have an increased risk of reherniation. By doing an aggressive discectomy, there's not much disc left to reherniate, so there's really going to have a lower decreased reherniation rate, but the disc space height will be less, thus the bones will be potentially rubbing bone on bone, and that, there's a downside to that. A less aggressive discectomy will result in better outcome. There are several studies that will show that, and we'll talk about them a little bit in the future. An aggressive discectomy results in a low reherniation rate, but overall, the patients do poorer. What we're trying to do now is combine the lace advances in annular repair with a less aggressive discectomy. Looking at the clinical outcomes of an aggressive versus li limited discectomy, we see from Eugene Kerrigy's study in Stanford published in the March 2006 spine that at two years, 9% of people that had an aggressive discectomy had a recurrent disc. However, the people who had the limited discectomy had a higher reherniation rate, but otherwise did very well. They had lower back, they had less back pain, they had less narcotic usage, they returned to work in a much more rapid fashion and were quite honestly much more satisfied with a 91% satisfaction rate at six months. Thus, it's been recommended that we proceed with a limited discectomy, and that's what we all do in this practice. Similar research shows that 
patients do better with a less aggressive discectomy. But the big issue is reherniation. So how do we allow the patients to have the better outcome but decrease the risk of reherniation? In this study, we note that approximately 14% of people will have back pain with modic type changes of the implant after a less aggressive discectomy and as high as 47% in the more aggressive. People who have a less aggressive discectomy have less drug use, better quality of life, and overall a better outcome. Well, the intuitive thought to this is basically to go in and repair that annulus to reinforce the outer fibers to decrease the incidence of that disc herniating again. The repair of the annulus fibrosis will hopefully reduce reoperations and improve patient outcomes by decreasing the amount of nuclear material that can re-extrude, reducing inflammation and scar formation, and enabling the surgeons to perform a less extensive disc removal. The other thing we've done is we've changed how we open the annulus or the covering of the disc. In the past, we oftentimes would do a box discectomy. Now we'll just do a slit discectomy, so it may be a little more difficult to remove the disc itself, but we tend to have less of an opening for disc to occur. Thus, we'll now move to the slit discectomy. That combined with the X-Close system really looks like we're able to minimize our risk of recurrence. This is a tension band system that allows us to reapproximate the soft tissues. This is what the x close looks like. It's basically a small little device. It's a single-use sterile device that has been approved by the FDA in September of 2006. Over 1,600 of these have been performed in the United States. And this allows us through a minimally invasive approach just to stick this in and repair the annulus, hopefully decreasing the risk of disc reherniations down the road. This is a video animation of the x close tubular repair system. And this graphic animation, now we're going to move a small part of the lamina. And this will allow us to gain access to the disc, the nerve root, and the fecal sac. You can see the nerve root itself being inflamed and irritated here. We'll identify that nerve root, mobilize it out of the way, and then we'll identify the disc herniation. We'll now make a small little slit incision in the annulus itself. And you can start to see the jelly of the nucleus start to herniate out. We'll go in and remove those loose fragments, doing a very limited discectomy. Once these loose fragments are out of the way, now the nerve will no longer be under any pressure. But as you can see, there's still a lot of nucleus left in the middle of that disc. Thus, we'll use the x close system now to go in and do a soft tissue repair. Place a small stab incision through one side of the annular uh, defect. Move to the other side. Tension that up, cut those small sutures, and then we'll basically do it from the contralateral corners to basically allow an X close in the shape of an X to provide the optimal repair of that annular defect. You can see the small pledges on the underside, which are the stabilizing pledges to hold everything together. Tension that up, cut the suture, and now we've restored the integrity of the annulus, decreasing the risk of disc reherniation, all in the matter of this small two-minute video, which is all the time it takes to do in the operating room. And that's the X-Close annular repair system. The post-market annular repair study is done in conjunction with the Spine and Neuro Center and Annulex Technologies. The Spine and Neuro Center is the only group in Alabama performing annular repair under this study. This will allow us to obtain substantial data to show that the benefits of annular repair following a discectomy do in fact decrease the risk of disc reherniation in our patients. This is a randomized, single-blind, parallel control design. It's a two-to-one randomization and what that means is that basically for every two repairs we'll do, there'll be one patient who has no repair, the traditional treatment. 550 patients will be enrolled at up to 40 centers, and the patients are evaluated in the post-operative period at two weeks, six months, 12 months, 18 months, and 24 months following their procedure. The primary endpoint is superiority. Thus, we're gonna look at reoperation rates. We'll also look at secondary endpoints of an Oswestry Disability Index score, visual analog pain score, quality of life, healthcare utilization, use of pain medications, return to work status, disc height collapse, as well as all adverse events. The first patient was enrolled in our office in March of 2007. There were approximately 247 patients enrolled 
83 have been randomized to control, 163 to exclose, and we're very pleased that we are the only practice in Alabama participating in this revolutionary exclose study. This is a map of the sites participating in the exclose study. This is a lumbar model where I'll demonstrate the exclose system. Basically, this is an example of the lumbar spine. This will be the spinous process of the superior vertebral body, inferior vertebral body. This is the lamina, the transverse process. The white band will represent the disc itself. And if you see, there's a small hole in it in a slit-like fashion. And that would be where we've done a small annulotomy where we got in, went in and removed the disc. The nerves themselves would be retracted out of the way. We would identify that small annular tear or the annular defect. We go in with the x close system just through the small tube, like we talked about. Go in, gently place this down through the annulus itself. Then we'll deploy one side. We'll come to the other side. We'll then tension up the annual repair system here. I'll have someone hold that model. Then basically what you can see is we'll actually repair that annulus, that annular defect where we now actually pull it together decreasing our risk of recurrence. And what you can see now with this stitch in place, we're gonna provide some nice tension on our annulus, making it much more difficult for a disc to herniate ever again. I'll cut this suture, and then basically so we can get our nice X, we'll do it in a similar fashion from one side to the other now. Starting over here, going down through the disc itself, allowing this to remove it deploy the pledgelets, which go on the underside, provide our resistance to the suture, pull up, come over to this side, just let go in. And then in a similar fashion, we'll just tighten this little surclage suture up. We'll pair that little hole in the uh, disc itself. You can see how that cinches down very nicely. And at this point, we've got it nice and tight. And so we really don't have to worry much about the potential for recurrent disc herniation. And that's about all the time it actually takes in the operating to do it. So around two minutes. In summary, patient outcomes of micro, after microdiscectomy are generally very positive, but there's significant room for improvement. Disc preservation with repair of the annulus is a valuable shift in our treatment paradigm. The ability to repair the annulus quickly and efficiently will hopefully decrease the risk of recurrent disc herniations down the road, resulting in a much more positive outcome for our patients. This is a commercially available product that facilitates the repair and preservation of soft tissue discs. Over 1,600 annular repairs have been done in the United States, and this is a post-market study in progress to further evaluate the benefits of annular repair. I hope you've enjoyed this CME. I hope it's been educational and productive. To receive your CME from Huntsville Hospital, please complete the evaluation form and return it to Beth Wister at the contact information on the CD. Thank you for your time. If there are any questions, please feel free to contact myself or any of the other neurosurgeons at the Spine and Neuro Center. Thank you.